That tendency to use institutional power as a way to elevate yourself and build your own brand is utterly prevalent in all of our institutions now. A lot of people use positions that ought to be positions of responsibility as though they were actually just positions of prominence. Um, at the same time, I do think that it's very important that we expect and demand responsible behavior from each other as citizens, which means showing some restraint, which means recognizing that to get your way in American life, you have to negotiate and deal with other people who have a different way that they want to get. Um, and, you know, we can't just stand at the, at the opposite ends of a room and talk about each other. We have to actually engage with each other. That's what living in a, in a, in a, in a democratic republic means. I think a lot of our politicians have forgotten that. I think a lot of voters have forgotten it too. And so the, the task of restoring the capacity of our institutions to be trustworthy again is actually a job for everyone. Mm -hmm. It has to begin with a question that we don't ask enough. And the question is, given the role that I have here, what should I be doing? Mm -hmm. Not just what do I want, not just how do I win, but given the role I have, whether that is president of the United States or a voter or a parent or a teacher, uh, an employee, an employer, given that role, how should I behave here? That's a question that seems to me to be the beginning of responsibility. And it's a question that is not asked enough in any of our institutions by people at the top or people at the bottom. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And boy, do we have another fantastic episode for you guys today. We have over 75 episodes in the backlog, and we are continuing to truck along. I, I did the math on how many we're going to have by the end of this year and the season, and it's like 90, and it's like... Oh, we're not even going to hit 100? Yeah, no, as far we're as not that's going next year. Next, okay. next season. All right. um, but uh, thank you guys, as always, for listening. Uh, to check out everything else we have cooking at American Moment, you can go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find different programs we're doing to help credential the next generation of conservative staff in Washington, D.C., to train them in what they need to know and to make sure they believe the right things about the constellation of issues that we care about here. Uh, sanity on foreign policy, immigration, trade, economics, culture, and so on. Um, normal things. We're normal boys with normal opinions, uh, despite what many would lead you to believe on the internet and elsewhere. You're anything but normal. Uh, but well, <laughs> point taken. Uh, I, I'm, I'm currently engaged in an exercise in weird maxing these days, uh, yeah. but I'm also still normal. Uh, but today we had on someone who uh, is maybe a little bit unexpected for many of you who listen to our show, uh, someone who comes from an institution that we typically wouldn't uh, have a lot in common with. But we had on today Dr. Yuval Levin, who we've had the pleasure of getting to uh, uh, become friends with and, and learn from over the past two years. He's someone who uh, we came to be familiar with because of his work on, on institutions. And uh, the funny thing is, is that he uh, is someone who puts his money where his mouth is, and he believes in new institutions, and he's been very kind in providing uh, advice and guidance to us as we try to build one here. And so we look up to him a lot. He's someone who I think is one of the most wise people on the right of center. And maybe we have some temperamental disagreements on uh, how bad we think things are at, at any given point in time. But uh, Dr. Levin is someone who, who is very much in the tent and someone we think has a lot of very interesting things to contribute to the conversation on the right of center. He's also someone who tends to share a lot of uh, uh, commonalities with the things uh, I'm obsessed with that other people aren't. And that's one of the reasons I, I particularly uh, like him as well. And we talked about some of those things on the show today. Um, namely, uh, I've I was going to say two. Uh, one, the uh, sort of sociological consequences of the fact that so many of the people who do work on the right come from sort of an academic background, specifically a political theory background. And then secondly, um, all of the bioethics and technological concerns that social conservatives uh, should have in this decade and beyond. Uh, both of those things are things that Dr. Levin is intimately involved with in his work on a daily basis. And, and we had a great conversation about, including um, an assessment of whether the institutions had it coming. Uh, you know, Dr. Levin can often, I think, be uh, uncharitably mischaracterized as someone who just kind of worships institutions a priori. It's not true. Um, he's someone who, who who looks at them critically. He believes they're important and he believes that they're failing. And so we talked about kind of the terms of engagement and 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 what uh, properly assessing and disciplining these institutions might look like. Um, what, Nick, what do you think of all that? So true. <laughs> Everything you said, yeah. cosine. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll have my own little bit of flavor. Um, I love getting together with with 
Dr. Levin. Uh, we've had lunch before, and I am a big history nerd. What I like to read is is uh, historical stuff, especially about uh, the American founding. So I always have a great time uh, whenever whenever I get together with uh, Dr. Levin, and I think his historical perspective um, on kind of the moment we're going through right now is very important and something that um, people working on the right should consider. To give a little bit of his formal background, I guess, uh, Dr. Yuval Levin is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where he also holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy. He's the founder and editor of National Affairs. He's a senior editor at The New Atlantis, a contributing editor at National Review, and a contributing opinion writer at The New York Times. Uh, at AEI, Dr. Levin just talks about all the cool things. Uh, foundations of self-government, the future of law, regulation, and constitutionalism, the state of American social, political, and civic life, and the preconditions for family, community, and country to flourish. He has a wide range of experience in and out of government and academia, on Capitol Hill, on the Budget Committee, the domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush, the President's Council on Bioethics. Uh, and he's written and been published and spoken everywhere there is. Uh, his most recent book is A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Uh, it is one of the uh, few books I've ever read in my entire life. It's true. Uh, <laughs> it's one of my most worn books on my shelf. Too. Yeah, I, I find myself going back to it all the time. Highly recommend you read it. It's breezy. It's well written. Uh, Dr. Levin is a very pithy and um, uh, capable writer in addition to all his other uh, virtues. We'll go now to uh, a wonderful hour of discussion with Dr. Yuval Levin. Dr. Levin, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, we always like to hear about people's background and how they got where they are today. I think yours is particularly applicable to a lot of the people in our audience who will likely flit somewhere between government and think tanks and the hill over the course mm. of their life. Uh, t tell us the story. Where Did did you come out fully formed as, a, <laughs> as, a, as one of the premier intellectuals in American life? How did you end up uh, uh, being who you are today? Well, I, my story has government and think tanks and uh, a, 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 and uh, the academy in it. Um, it's hard to know where to start. I, I was born in Israel um, in 1977. My family came to the United States when I was eight years old. So I grew up here uh, in Philadelphia and then in New Jersey. I, I wouldn't say fully formed, but I knew by high school that I was interested in politics. That's about as much as I knew, and that I was on the right, um, and I wanted to go to school in Washington. I ended up going to college at American University uh, here in D.C., studied political science, and I was a Hill staffer from the very beginning. Not, not, I was an intern maybe for a semester, but I needed a job, and so I worked for my local member of Congress, a Republican named Bob Franks, uh, who was a wonderful member of the House for many years and then ran for Senate, ran for governor uh, in New Jersey. Um, he was a uh, he was a member of the Budget Committee, and through his office, I ended up working as a Budget Committee staffer as I was finishing up my undergrad. Um, this was in the late 90s. Uh, John Kasich was chair of the Budget Committee. Uh, from there, I went to work for Newt Gingrich in his last two years as Speaker of the House. Um, and when, uh, when Newt uh, unceremoniously lost his job after the 98 election, uh, which, by the way, as I like to point out, was an election in which Republicans gained seats, yeah. but not enough seats <laughs> to keep Newt Gingrich in office, yeah. um, I decided that I wanted to deepen my grasp of the underlying ideas, to think about political philosophy and not just uh, politics in practice. And I went to the University of Chicago for a PhD. Um, I did a PhD there in a program called the Committee on Social Thought, which is uh, a very University of Chicago kind of thing, a multidisciplinary uh, PhD in the social sciences and humanities. But my focus was really on political theory. Um, I wrote a dissertation there on Edmund Burke. I studied with some wonderful teachers, and among them was Leon Cass, who uh, himself a conservative uh, taught there for many years. And Cass, in 2001, after the after George W. Bush was elected, um, was tapped to run a presidential commission on bioethics to advise the president on stem cell research, cloning related things. And because I had some Washington experience and I was a student of his and I was done with my courses and writing a dissertation, he asked me to come and work for him in, on that commission. Um, I had not really studied bioethics. Um, you know, I, I, th there is a way in which studying political theory can help you better understand bioethics. Yeah. But basically, I learned on the job. Um, I was a, 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 a staff member on that commission. At, by, by the end of it, I was the staff director. Um, and from there, through that work, I got to know people in the Bush White House. 
because the bioethics issues were bizarrely prominent in the early mm -hmm. 2000s uh, in retrospect. And Why was that? Was it because the human genome was on the verge of being Yeah, the human instead? genome project cloning, the first mammalian cloning happened in 1997. Um, and then stem cell research, really. Embryonic stem cell research became a, a massive political issue because the left could use it as a, uh, as a way to talk about abortion without talking about abortion, mm -hmm. as a way to make pro-lifers look bad. And so the case for destroying embryos for research became incredibly prominent in democratic political rhetoric. John Kerry in 2004 mentioned it six or seven times in his acceptance speech at the convention. Um, just nuts. <laughs> uh, and so it, it was a very prominent issue. And because of its prominence, our work le led me to connect some with folks at the White House. Um, and some of them I'd known in other ways too, so that when there was an opening right after the 04 election on the domestic policy staff at the White House, um, I ended up getting that job. And from the end of 2004 until uh, sometime in 2007, I was a White House staffer on the domestic policy staff. I worked on healthcare and on culture of life issues, the, the social conservative issues, and veterans and a few other things. Um, and spent those uh, three, almost four years uh, at the White House at a, at a very interesting and exciting time, though not one in which domestic politics was particularly prominent on the president's agenda. Um, and after that, I went to work at, in the think tank world. Uh, I went to the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a wonderful, small um, uh, conservative think tank that has always punched way above its weight and does to this day. Um, while I was working at the Bioethics Commission, I'd been involved in a little bit of EPPC's work. Um, I'd helped them to start a journal called The New Atlantis uh, with, with a few friends. Um, and that journal's still around and doing wonderful, wonderful work. So as I was looking at next steps, EPPC was a natural place to go. And I was there for, um, I was there for 12 years, from 2007 till 2019. I uh, then went to the American Enterprise Institute, where I am to this day. So I have a question, kind of, because you've seen all three, or well, m many of the different facets through which one can be involved in sort of public life, academics, the Hill, presidential administrations, and think tanks. W one of the questions that that I tend to have a lot about the right is because academia is in many cases closed off to members of the right, a lot of the people who otherwise, if, if they were uh, in their most happy place uh, as uh, would be academics, yeah. instead come into the political world. Right. Do, do you think that's accurate? And, and, and how, how do you think that ends up affecting the landscape of, of political thought and, and mm -hmm. action on the right of center specifically? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, a place like the American Enterprise Institute is full of people who would probably rather be professors. Mm -hmm. And many of them should be and at, at great schools, but aren't because they're on the right. Um, I think there's no question that's true. So that the, the, the quality of scholarship in some of the conservative think tanks um, is higher than in some of the progressive think tanks because the, the progressives who would be doing that work are at Harvard and Yale. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe they're doing good work. I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> they're not in the immediate orbit of the political in a way that a lot of political scientists and economists and others are on the right. Now, I think there's, a, I, I think there's another consequence implication of that that can be a problem for us sometimes, which is that in a way, in order to become that scholar, you have to go through the university. Mm -hmm. um, and that that combined with the hostility to conservatives that you find in a lot of universities, which isn't new. I mean, I can tell you, having applied to graduate school in 1998, um, it's not new. <laughs> it was there then. Believe me, I was applying with a letter of recommendation from Newt Gingrich. So <laughs> I, I learned something about this in those years. Yeah. Um, Part of what it's meant is that the places conservatives go in the academy tend to be uh, a fairly narrow range, mm -hmm. which means that among our academics and scholars on the right, we have a lot of political theorists because there are places to go that are very good. We have a lot of economists because economics has been, at least until the last few years, I think it, I think the, the academic discipline of economics is actually moving left very, very fast mm -hmm. now. But until relatively recently, that wasn't so much the case. Um, so we have a lot of political theorists and a lot of economists. We don't have a lot of historians. We don't have a lot of sociologists. 
um, which are, I think, very important uh, to understanding society and American life. And that does have an effect on how we think about politics to the extent that intellectuals are important, which is a limited extent. Let's be, let's, <laughs> let's be fair. Um, the rights intellectuals tend to think in regime terms, tend to think in terms of political theory or in economic terms, and tend not to think in sociological terms, in terms of family and community, in terms of, of human social forms. We very quickly jump to political philosophy. And I say this myself, that's my education, mm -hmm. so I'm part of the problem, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but to, to find conservative sociologists is one of the great challenges for us in the think tank world at this point, because I think the problems we have are to a very great degree sociological problems, but the diagnoses we have for understanding them and the prescriptions we have for doing something about them tend to be either political theory or economics, and they're often just not the best fit. And the, I guess the, the downstream implication of not having enough historians is, you know, his, a historian would look, would take the work of the political theorist and, and recognize where uh, practice deviates from Absolutely. theory. It's, it's the study of regimes and practice across time. And if you don't have yes. that, you don't see how ideas actually yeah, play political out. theory is very clean. Yeah. History is very messy. And you need both. You need to understand what the principles are, but also how politics actually works. Um, and I do think there are a lot of ways in which we could benefit from more historians. Uh, I, you know, I say on the right, just not on the left mm -hmm. would be nice. Um, and and also more sociologists, absolutely. Well, you've been involved with the conservative movement through, I think, a very interesting time. I think interesting <laughs> is a good word. Yeah. <clears throat> it's for always it. interesting, the conservative <laughs> yeah. movement. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I'm curious to to hear what you think has kind of changed from a from a posture perspective on a lot of these sociological issues mm -hmm. on the right, particularly a lot of the social issues that you were mentioned working on in the White House, right. like um, you know talking about families, marriage, children, that sort of thing. How has that posture changed? Yeah, yeah. I I would say well, first of all, I do think it's always interesting in the conservative movement for good and bad. Um, there's there are always internal dissensions. A rising generation always has the sense that things were very clean and clear and unified until yesterday, but now they're a mess. <laughs> I certainly had that sense when I was you know, in my 20s in Washington, um, and I think people do now. And you know, in a lot of ways, the divisions we have uh, are, are pretty durable. Um, the tensions between libertarians and social conservatives, the sense that the party should advance the interests of the working class. These are not new ideas. Even, you know, Catholic integralism, you can find it in the 1970s in the debates on the right. Um, so it is important to see that these things are pretty durable. But I also think there are ways in which the, the emphasis and the tone and the attitudes change over time in ways that we should pay attention to. Um, I think what we mean by social issues has changed some um, over the course of the 20 years or so that I've now spent in Washington. Um, it's changed from being fundamentally about an idea of the human person, so uh, concerns about family, concerns about human dignity, concerns about, uh, about ethics as traditionally understood, to being much more about social power and and control of institutions. So that now when we say social issues, we often mean things like, uh, you know, who's in charge of the schools um, and who controls the flow of information. Um, we're, we're much more often talking about uh, fighting big corporations that, that try to limit our ability to express ourselves. These are social issues, but they're different social issues, and they suggest that the right has come to think of itself much more as being in an embattled place, um, as being on, on its hind legs in a sense. Um, I'm actually not sure that this change is quite justified. Um, I think in some ways the right is in a stronger position than it was, say, in 1990. Um, there's much more of a right of center media now than there was that. There was none, so it's not that hard. But um, the right has much more power in the media now than it used to. It has much more power in social media than it did in traditional media. The right has much more power in the courts now than it did in 1990, much more, more than would have even been imaginable. It has much more power in Congress than it did in 1990, when it had been out of power in both houses for most of the previous 40 years. Um, so in some ways, the, the American right is actually much more powerful now and in a better position. Obviously, there are also many ways in which we've lost ground. 
um, in corporate America, in our economic debates, in I would say something like the 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 national the general national sense of the nature of family and community, um, kind of cultural consensus. So I I think it's much more of a mixed picture than we tend to think. But the right's attitude and disposition toward the country now is more alarmed, more defensive, more panicked. Um, and I think that has affected the way we think about what the issues are and how we should approach them. And in some ways, it's affected it for the worse. I mean, I think we should be more calm about the condition of the country because the left is much less impressive than we seem to imagine in our in our worst fears. Do you think it's partially because of the emergence of genuine alternatives in those fields you mentioned that the contradictions are are visible so you know in an environment where i mean the people always say you know when they're talking about the media they make these peons to like oh the walter cronkite era where no you know we had a right. truthful media and everything it's like well you look back it's not really a case it's just yeah. that we had, we had no we had no way to tell we had no yeah. point of reference and so on a medium term time horizon the process of creating alternatives and realizing the corruption that was previously invisible because there was nothing to compare it to, wouldn't a political movement on a natural trajectory start to get really antsy about now or in the past five well, years? Well, in some ways, right? So I certainly think that some of the ways in which we now have the ability to criticize, examine, push against some of the power of the left has made it easier for us to see some of the problems that are out there. You know, the there was a maybe too many viewers and listeners are too young to remember this, but in the course of the two thousand and four, maybe the two thousand election, it turned out that Dan Rather had, who was the chief anchor on CBS, was spreading basically absolute misinformation <laughs> using falsified documents about George W. Bush. And this was revealed because somebody in the middle of nowhere looked at that, looked at something and thought, that doesn't look right, and got in touch with a blogger, and together they figured out that it was falsified. And the, the, the reaction to this was, oh my God, the media is losing its legitimacy. The reaction should have been, well, this has probably always been going on, and yeah. now we have the internet, mm -hmm. yeah. and some guy in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota can just kind of use his, the expertise he's built up over years and, and challenge you know, the, the chief anchor of the CBS Evening News. That kind of thing happens now more than it did, and it's very important that it does. And I do think there are ways that, for that reason, we can we can discern corruption where it's not that it didn't exist before, we just couldn't find it before because we didn't have this kind of power. At the same time, though, I think we should also see that we now have more alternatives, more choices and options, more power, and that even though the New York Times today is objectively worse than it was in 1990, it is also objectively much less important than yeah. it was in 1990. And it was pretty damn bad in 1990s. Yeah. So I think on net, these institutions of the left are weaker, not stronger than they were. Um, and you know, I think m more broadly than that, as a political movement that tries to appeal to voters and to Americans who are not already with us, uh, despair and panic just aren't very attractive. We've mm -hmm. got to talk, speak with some confidence about what we can offer the country for the future. Um, and I do worry that we don't do enough of that on the right. It's It's got to be an important piece of what we have to say. Mm -hmm. at, at a macro level, uh, the analysis uh, seems like something you can boil down to the question of whether um, the institutional decline over the last five to 10 years has been a process of recognition of existing issues um, or or a uh, process of, of causing them. I mean, you know, yeah. something people say about Trump all the time is that Trump divided the country. Well, the counter I find to that is that maybe Trump exposed divisions right. that already existed in the right. country. How do you how do you think about like the the moral valence of 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 revealing existing divisions quicker on the path to resolution? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, how, how do you think about, you know, what a what a public square that's healthy and responsible should look like, given that there are real issues dividing the yeah. American people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the easy answer to that question is it's both. Um, it is both uh, revealing an underlying truth and making things worse. The harder answer is it's not five to ten years. the 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 decline of our institutions and the decline of public trust in our institutions, uh, more to the point, has been going on for the last half century. Mm -hmm. So that if you really look at public trust in institutions in the United States, the place to the place this normally starts because Gallup only started asking this question in 1973 is the early 70s, 
Um, and what you find is that in those years, in, in mid-century America and a little later, Americans had an insane amount of trust in institutions, way too much. Um, even, even somebody like me who thinks we should have more trust than we do now, the, the idea that in the early 1970s, uh, you know, large majorities of Americans expressed confidence in Congress, I think that's just crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and it was very unusual. That would not have been the case in the 19th century. It would not have been the case in the 1930s. Um, after decades of depression and war and mobilization, the United States came out into the mid-century world very, very confident of its leaders, of its elites, um, and in a lot of ways overconfident. And that became clear over time. It became clear in the course of the Vietnam War. It became clear as the Great Society failed to uh, keep its promises. And you find beginning in the late 1970s, mid-1970s, a, a decline of public confidence in institutions that has been pretty steady. Um, in some ways, it has accelerated in the 21st century, but it was, it was already well into a significant decline by the beginning of this century. Um, I think some of the reasons behind it have to do with greater visibility, greater transparency into those institutions. They always had problems, and we didn't always see those problems or always want to see them. Um, some of it had to do with, with changing attitudes about those institutions. And I think in this sense, the story is more complicated. Um, the, the, the America of the middle of the 20th century was an extraordinarily cohesive and consolidated country. Every voice in American culture was telling everyone to be more like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You had in the first half of the 20th century, uh, it, it, the, the tail edge of industrialization combined with mass media, combined with, with, with mass government, growing in ways that created a mass culture, mm -hmm. a mass society. By the middle of the 20th century, you find incredible resistance and unease with this, with this kind of conformity. Mm -hmm. Everything about the culture of the late 1950s, left and right, is screaming for relief from conformity. Right, so it's not just Holden Caulfield and uh, the movies of the '50s, but if you read the opening editorial of National Review, which we remember for saying we stand athwart history, yelling stop, most of what it said was an argument against bigism, against conformity. Uh, it was a very, very libertarian call for liberation, and liberation did come. Uh, American society became gradually liberalized, starting in the early 1960s. And the, the results of that, many of them were good. I think a more liberal economy than we had in 1950 is a good thing. Um, and, uh, and a more liberal culture than we had in 1950 is in some important respects a good thing. But we're now witnessing the, the, the downsides of that excess. Mm -hmm. Where every voice was saying, be more like everybody else, now every voice is saying, be yourself. Mm -hmm. And what the culture is screaming for is not release from conformity, but some cohesion, some solidarity, some unity. And on both the left and the right, I think you're finding that people are trying to answer that call for unity and cohesion. It doesn't always look good. Sometimes it looks like socialism. Uh, sometimes it looks like nationalism. But it is a response to the desire for more national unity, more cohesion, more conformity. And I do think that that's going to involve and require more confidence in our institutions. But in thinking about that question, the problem to solve is not that people don't have confidence in our institutions. It's that the institutions are not worthy of confidence. Mm -hmm. And the work that has to be done is work on the institutions, not on public attitudes, um, is work on a kind of revitalization of responsibility, and especially elite responsibility, which, is, which has been disastrously lost in American life, in every realm of American life. And I think that should be work for conservatives over the coming decades. But boy, it is a long-term project. So that's what I'd like to talk about next is is why exactly institutional decline uh, isn't the fault of the people perceiving it. I mean, what, what elite America seems to want to do and, and now uh, concerningly has the tools to do, do so through uh, control over big tech and some other things is to basically delegitimize criticism of wavered institutions. Um, it's 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 the proles problem yeah. that they don't trust the funny man, um, you know, who says that they're a senior health official at HHS, Rachel Levine, or you know, or what have you, and and that. Um, is concerning because they, they actually do have the power to to legitimate that in some cases, um, but is it 
the the question I have is: Is it chicken or egg? What, what, what do you think induces the downward spiral that we've been in over the timeline you're saying is a half century? Was it uh, institutions failing first, or people's perception of institutions declining first? You know, here I take my lead from the thinking of the of the American Constitution. Um, the the Constitution and its framers do not trust the pub the public, and they do not trust elites. Mm-hmm. They think that we should not trust anyone and that we should have a system that channels and directs power in ways that set these different forces in society against each other so that they can each achieve something but also each check the other. I think the answer to the question is it is the fault of both. I think unchecked populism is an irresponsible force. It is an inherently self-indulgent and irresponsible force that can be extremely dangerous if you just blame everything on elites and take no responsibility for anything yourself in your own life, you're an irresponsible person and a bad citizen and probably a bad uh, member of your family and community. That's no way to be. On the other hand, elite irresponsibility is also extremely dangerous and extremely common and prevalent. And if you have authority in some set of institutions in American life, but you don't take yourself to be bounded by that responsibility, by your obligations to the people who are served by those institutions, then you are reckless, irresponsible, dangerous, and don't deserve power. And the fact is, both of these are utterly prevalent in the life of any free society. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. We didn't invent them in the 21st century. The question is, how do we deal with them in such a way that might make both the general public and leaders of institutions more responsible. That word responsible, responsibility, which is a wonderfully American word, one of the very first uses of it that you can find in the English language is in Madison's Notes on the Constitution, because responsibility is required for living in a republic. It is distinct to republicanism that every citizen has to be responsible both for their own lives and for the fate of the community. And so I think the question for us is how to incentivize and induce and compel responsibility. Uh, some of that is just moralism. Some of that is, is literally telling people to be better. And no one should be uh, afraid to do that in American life. We should absolutely be in a place to say, this person who's supposed to be in charge of this, of this agency in the middle of a pandemic is behaving utterly irresponsibly and is advancing himself and his own image and brand instead of doing his work. Can't imagine who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> you know, not to, not to name names, but, you know, it actually could be a lot of people, yeah, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, that tendency to use institutional power as a way to elevate yourself and build your own brand is utterly prevalent in all of our institutions now. A lot of people use positions that ought to be positions of responsibility as though they were actually just positions of prominence. Um, At the same time, I do think that it's very important that we expect and demand responsible behavior from each other as citizens, which means showing some restraint, which means recognizing that to get your way in American life, you have to negotiate and deal with other people who have a different way that they want to get. Um, And, you know, we can't just stand at at the opposite ends of a room and talk about each other. We have to actually engage with each other. That's what living in a, in, a, in, a, in a democratic republic means. I think a lot of our politicians have forgotten that. I think a lot of voters have forgotten it too. And so the, the task of restoring the capacity of our institutions to be trustworthy again is actually a job for everyone. It has to begin with a question that we don't ask enough. And the question is, given the role that I have here, what should I be doing? Mm-hmm. Not just what do I want, not just how do I win, but given the role I have, whether that is president of the United States or a voter or a parent or a teacher, uh, an employee, an employer, given that role, how should I behave here? That's a question that seems to me to be the beginning of responsibility. And it's a question that is not asked enough in any of our institutions by people at the top or people at the bottom. So <laughs> that was great. Uh, That's the first time I think we've yeah, ever done that. Yeah. You go first. Uh, the so I, I want to focus in on perhaps a couple of, of key institutions that are mm-hmm. front of mind these days uh, to both hear your, your diagnosis of how they have corrupted themselves um, and, and, and sort of who is to blame and, and what a restoration of legitimacy might look like. 
the military yeah. to start with. Yeah. Um, and, and that can be taken as a synecdoche for maybe something more broad than that, the armed forces or foreign sure. policy establishment. But that very curious, specifically the American military, because it seems, and I think you wrote in your book about how it was the last vestige potentially yeah. of institutional trust in American life. And uh, many of your takes age wonderfully. That one <laughs> seems to have not. Well, it's still, <laughs> in public opinion, the military is yeah. much more trusted than any other institution, yes. even, even in the latest Gallup numbers from last month. Yeah. But it is declining. Yes. Am I right? It is. And so uh, what what is your diagnosis of, yeah. of why that's happening and, and should it be happening? So I think the first thing to recognize about the distinction that you find around the military in survey data about public opinion is that all those surveys begin in the mid 70s. And in the mid 70s, public opinion about the military was very, very low. Public mm -hmm. trust in the military was lower than public trust in Congress or in the media or all kinds of things. Uh, you know, that had to do with Vietnam, it had to do with a variety of things, but the military is the only major institution, the only national institution that has seen public trust increase over that period, that 50-year that period. Every, in every other arena, you've seen it fall. And part of the reason that it's increased, I think, has to do with a concerted decision made by the U.S. military in the 1980s to present itself to the public not only in terms of how it defends the country, and in fact, almost not at all in those terms, but in terms of how it forms human beings, so that the Army and the Marines, in a certain way the Navy as well, began to present themselves to the American public as, uh, as institutions that create and form responsible people. Um, if you think about the, the slogans, the recruiting slogans that the Army and the Marines have been using for the last half century, they're all about being serious, responsible people. Um, and I think Americans over time gradually came to see the military in that way, and with some reason. Um, you know, the, the military actually has been better than most of our institutions at forming decent people. When someone tells you that they went to Harvard, you know, maybe you think that's a smart person because they got into Harvard. Maybe you think that. Um, I have to say I don't. But uh, you don't think that because they went to Harvard, right? Harvard didn't make them smart. But if they got in, maybe that tells you something about some how they tested. When someone tells you they went to the Naval Academy, you're much more likely to think this is a serious person. Mm -hmm. And not because they got in, but because the Naval Academy actually makes people more serious mm -hmm. when they leave than when they enter. And they might get kicked out if they aren't and able they, to Exactly. To they have it. standards, and you have to live up to them. And the culture is a, is a certain kind of culture of integrity and serious uh, a, a, a attention to behavior. It is actually a culture that shapes that shapes people who ask, given my role here, how should I behave? Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice if American higher education in general could say that about itself mm -hmm. because it shapes our elites, uh, but it doesn't shape them that way at all. And so I think that's a big part of why public trust in the military rose for decades, starting in the late 1970s. Um, I, I do think that Americans have begun to think that the military has has been giving up on this sense of responsibility and, and instead has been doing what all other institutions are doing, which is trying to offer the people within it platforms to stand on and participate in the culture war. Another place to stand and yell about oppression or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's what, that's what all of our elite institutions are now. And in some respects, so it is still to a much lesser degree than, you know, Brown University, um, the military does now take part in that kind of, of theatric that it stayed out of before mm -hmm. and said, so that's not our role, this is our role. Um, the more it does that, the more it will lose public confidence because that is why the other institutions have lost it. And it's no mystery what will happen if the military comes to be perceived as just another institution that is a venue for virtue signaling. I don't think that has happened to nearly the degree that it has in our other governing institutions and uh, many of our private institutions, but that it's happening at all is very disconcerting. I'd be curious to see the difference in, in polling <clears throat> from your average American on you know, their opinion of people that enlist and kind of the the very like high level officers i'm right. sure that there's probably a a pretty large um disparity there what would you say the the kind of comparison with what's going on with the elites in the military and the elites in government in media you know in the public sphere how are they similar you know going through some of the same 
the same issues and failing in the same yeah. way. Well, I do think there are some just obvious similarities where the military allows itself or even seems eager to be drawn into the latest cultural fads and you know we we do this too we we have the same policies as uh, whatever you know large corporation you want to point to that does this and that about diversity the 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 more that the military perceives itself as part of that same elite culture the more that it will be perceived by the public as part of that same elite culture and that culture is not trusted and is not popular um so i i, I do think it runs that risk now I also think that it's still the case that in even the relatively upper ranks of the military, there's a different attitude about about duty and country and obligation. I mean, look, the military is unabashedly patriotic. Whatever else you say about it, right, it's not, it's not Google. Um, and I do think that makes a difference to people, the sense that there's something higher here that, that you're committed to, and that that something higher somehow involves all of us, um, I think is still powerfully felt among a lot of people. Um, and I think the military has got to pay much more attention to preserving that sense by making sure that it's true uh, if it wants to keep the public's trust and it needs the public's trust. I think uh, the tagline on the U.S. Army ads that run on YouTube at the very least um, is something along the lines of, you know, uh, all we need is the best you've got, which just feels <laughs> like a real, real slippage from... Boot camp is going yeah. to destroy well, you and I'm remake need you more as a than man. That. Just not. I mean, there's there's so many layers of decline. How, how much do you think it it has to do with um, institutions wanting to universalize themselves? You know, in relation to the question of women admitted in armed forces, but also just uh, no institution is, is willing to, in mass culture, have limited appeal. They all have to have universal appeal because otherwise they feel like they're doing something wrong. Well, I, I, I think that's part of the story here. I think the sense of what it means to be universal is very distorted in in a lot of our elite culture. Uh, it's built on a blindness to a large segment of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it within a bubble, you want to speak to everyone and you don't see who's outside that bubble. I think that, that, that institutional strength and trust is built by, by self-imposed constraints. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that we trust an institution when it's clear to us that there are things it would not do. Mm -hmm. Not only when it's clear that it's good at what it does, which is important, but also when it's clear that there are things it would not do. I would trust a scientist if I really had the sense that this person <clears throat> is only going to say what's been through the process of, of genuine scientific method verification. I believe in that process, and I think that that, in fact, can distinguish truth from falsehood. But when it seems like this person just wants to be part of the bigger game, um, and and part of the larger kind of cultural theater. And so there aren't things that this person would not do, and he wouldn't limit himself because he hasn't tested it. Um, then I can't trust him anymore. So that desire for, if you want to call it universality, or just participation in the big, unbounded cultural theater um, is, is just poison to public trust in institutions. How much, um, so, you know, given... The, the situation you've laid out where the military is is peacocking in these particular ways. You know, the military is a central institution of American life. It's core to how any nation would operate itself. What's the terms of engagement? You know, X institutional decline means that a certain level of skepticism needs to be brought to bear in terms yeah. of enforcing institutional discipline. Again, the time preference on these questions is always so interesting to me because um, in a given moment, no one likes the process of living un under institutional distrust, but you have to have it if you're ever going to get back to a point where the institution yep. is trustworthy. So what's the terms I mean, he, of engagement? You know, here, the military is actually a good example because we, we trust our military today a lot more than we did in 1975. Mm -hmm. Despite all of the decline that we have seen, which has been decline over the last few years, uh, Americans have much more trust, not less, which means the military has been through a period like this mm -hmm. that was actually a lot worse or that got a lot worse than this so far has gotten. And you can see ways in which the, 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 the leadership of the military took that problem seriously, sought to do something about it, both by changing public policy, by creating the old volunteer force, by changing the way that the military approaches the larger society. In what terms do we speak to the public? How do we present what it is that we do? How do we do what we do? Um, I do think that that kind of, um, th that kind of rethinking 
is necessary for the military, it's necessary for a lot of our institutions, once they see that they are losing public trust and, crucially, that they're losing it for good reason, right? Once they stop blaming those who don't trust them for not trusting them, but ask themselves, how do we get to a place where that's not the natural attitude? Then I think they can think about how to display uh, their abilities and their responsibilities in ways that can be persuasive to the larger public. A lot of our institutions now, because they don't see that the public mistrust is rooted in something serious, are not in a phase where they're thinking about how do we become more responsible and how do we make it clear that we're becoming more responsible. But that's necessary. It's necessary in the military. It's necessary in higher education, in our governing institutions, in a lot of the professions. I think it's important to see that this is a moment of public mistrust that requires clear thinking about how to build trust. And I do think that we will see more of that, but I don't think we're seeing it now. This is not a moment where that uh, has has sunk in. How essential is generational turnover to a process of institutional renewal? And if it is, the fact that the boomers seem to be completely unwilling to relinquish power and influence over American institutions, does that does that bode poorly for the yeah. uh, the near and medium term of, of these institutions? Well, here you have invited me to grind my axe. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I wrote a piece not long ago, um, actually in the New York Times, about why our leaders are so damn old. And they, they did me the favor of putting a picture of a walker in front of a microphone. In front of it. So just to <clears throat> depress the point. Yeah. Um, but look, I, I do think that um, that th- the leaders of our of our core institutions in America now, outside of just a few sectors, are really unusually old, and this is a particular problem in our politics. Um, you know, w- we have a president who is uh, eighty years old. Uh, his predecessor is thinking of running again; would be seventy eight, which is the age that the president was, the current president was when he was elected. That's a terrible idea. Uh, w- w- you know, the the leadership of the Congress is exceptionally old. Um, I, I I think that makes a difference. I think it makes a difference in some less than obvious ways, though. Um, w- one of the key ways in which it makes a difference is that the the life cycle of the boomers dominates our sense of the historical cycles of American life, so that we think of 1950s, early 60s America as a norm. Um, because that's when the boomers were young and things seemed great. And look, when I was young, things seemed great. But uh, the 1950s and early 60s were not normal. They were not normal at all. Um, They were not normal for American foreign policy. They were not normal for American economics. They were not normal for American culture and society, religiosity, all kinds of things. The life we lead now as a country is much more like 19th century America than like mid 20th century America. And in a funny way, in order for us to learn from our own history, we have to somehow lessen the gravitational force of the life cycle of the baby boomers f- over our self-understanding. Mm. And I'll, I'll put it this way just very quickly. If you're born 1950, the peak year of the baby boom, um, you think the 50, you see the 50s through the eyes of a little kid, and you think they were simple and strong families and everything. That is not the 1950s, but that's what you think they were because you were a, a kid. You think the 60s were, you know, you see them through the eyes of a teenager. They were exciting. The music was good. Every, the world could change for the better. A revolution was possible. You see the 70s through the eyes of a kind of 20-year-old where suddenly you realize things are not working out for me. You're in a cold sweat. Uh, what do I do? Uh, you lose faith in everything. You see the 80s through the eyes of, of, of someone in their 30s. You know, you think about the mortgage a little more than you think about revolution by that point. The 90s are like the peak of human civilization. Everything belongs to you. (laughs) You're running it. It's all great. The 2000s, you start to worry a little bit. and It's not really your world anymore. By now, you're just in total disarray and, and, and despair about the future. And somehow your grandkids could never have the world of the 1950s. This is just a crazy way to think Mm -hmm. about American life. Mm -hmm. And it is the boomer way. And it's a way that we've got to put behind us. There's no, uh, there's no other way forward for the country. I did not expect that we'd get some boomer bashing. I love it. It's great. I, I'm well, a Gen Xer. I, I bash everyone equally. Well, yeah. so, so I, I want to get into that because I, I've kind of had this, um, a bit of a riff for a while that like, Gen X is actually the worst generation. No offense, <laughs> because they, they really, you know, I, I think Obama is probably an outlier in this case, but you don't see a lot of Gen Xers stepping Obama's up. Obama's a to, boomer. Yeah, there, to, there have been no oh, Gen Xers. Oh, technically, Xer yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, but, but you don't really see like Gen Xers stepping up to take 
kind of the mantle from the boomers, you know, Mm -hmm. partially because they won't die, but also (laughs) because um, I think there there's just kind of this lack of self knowing, I guess, for for Gen Xers. So looking back at American history, you know, you mentioned um, we're kind of living in a 19th century moment right now. What should we be expecting, you know, Gen Xers, millennials, uh, the Zoomers? Uh, <laughs> what do you expect from us in the in the years to come? What do you expect to see? <laughs> well, look, it's up to us. I don't think we should think about the future in terms of expectations, but in terms of obligations and responsibilities, what should we be doing? Um, I do think, though, that it's very important to see that um, moments of decline can be and have been followed by moments of resurgence, that there are a lot of ways in which um, the moment we're living through now looks, for example, like the 1970s, and there was a genuine resurgence. I mean, we sort of deny this now, but there really was um, in in all manner of, of uh, facets of American life that followed that decline because people don't like to live in a miserable situation and do look for ways forward. So I really urge people against despair and against a politics that is rooted in despair in a sense that this is over and needs to be blown up. This is not over and should not be blown up. We should look for ways to revitalize our constitutional system, to revitalize our core institutions, and for for God's sake, to build new institutions, not to think that we just have to find ways to wear our grandparents' clothing. That is not what progress looks like. We have to think about what's new that's needed. Um, and I absolutely do think that that's what's ahead of us, that a period of resurgence is ahead of us. And we, want, we, we should think from a position of strength about how to do that well and how to do that in a way that puts our children uh, in, in a great place to succeed and thrive. But, you know, what's required of us is stepping up, is stepping up for leadership. I think there's no question that, that the, the, the Gen Xers, and I'm, I'm a young Gen Xer. I was born in 1977. I'm almost a millennial, though I will not admit that. Um, and it's absolutely the case that not only in politics, but in corporate America and in a lot of institutions, that generation has not pushed its way to the top. And in many ways, in many cases, it probably just won't. Um, it, you know, maybe we'll have a Gen X or president. I hope so. I, I, I think that'd be nice. But maybe we won't. Um, and in any case, I, I think it's very important to think about what we owe the future in those terms, in terms of what we owe the future, what's required of us so that our kids are in a better place a generation from now. And again, for me, that falls back to responsibility, to an obligation to take the future seriously and try to rebuild the institutions that we can't replace and replace the ones we can. Do you think that the aspect of kind of narcissism that comes with assuming the window of time of childlike innocence that a generation grows up with is ideal, that's just baked into the human condition? And the way you counter against that is having consistent generational uh you know uh churn so that one generation's vision doesn't completely dominate institutional life um and if that's the case is part of the problem that the boomers are too institutionally locked in to a particular way of assessing problems dealing with them um, and have the bias of having reformed them themselves and so are unwilling to recognize new problems. Yeah, I think in some ways that's true. Uh, and, and yes, it's baked in. I mean, it always happens. I, I talk to young people now who just assume that the logic of the kind of post-2015 politics is the logic of politics going forward. Mm-hmm. And it's not. Politics I, began in 2015. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. I, now, that doesn't mean we know what it will be. But I, I can just tell you, I, you know, I, I teach college students every summer. I've been doing it for, uh, I don't know, about 12 years now. And even in those 12 years, the, the sense of wh- what kind of politics the future will involve has moved from a very, very technocratic idea to a much more ideological, in the, in, in the better sense, kind of notion that this is a battle of ideas to a kind of cultural battle. Um, and, and we're now in a place where people assume that the, the Trump era divisions are here to stay. I just don't think any of that is true. Um, and, you know, culture does change. Politics does move. It is very important to see that. Um, but but absolutely, I mean, there are ways in which the boomers are just too comfortable uh, in leadership positions in these institutions. And, you know, it's worth seeing. They didn't really build all these things, right? The the idea that the that the, the way we think about government since the, the Great Society, for example, is the natural way. The boomers didn't create the Great Society. They inherited it from their parents. 
Um, and in that sense, it's even more built in for them. They were kids, right, in the 60s when, uh, when, when this all got started, but they can't think their way past it. They can't see the ways in which it's not adequate. They can't see the ways in which it might change. And so in some ways on both the left and the right, we're kind of locked in a debate that's basically a yes or no question about the great society. Mm-hmm. And that's just not the right question anymore. Part of the downstream consequence of institutional um, malaise and, and, and ossification because boomers won't go away uh, is that new real problems that emerge in the world around us get less attention than they otherwise deserve to, yeah. I think. You know, that has to do with a lot of some of the institutional reprioritization on the right of center. Maybe we should pay more attention to China and, yep. you know, uh, our industrial base, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but one of the elements of it that, that you've been personally involved in um, is is how technology is the tail wagging the dog on the contours of our society anymore. Mm-hmm. And maybe what it means for for social conservatives to be involved in that. Uh, wh- yeah. What has uh, your hair on fire right now that no one's paying attention to uh, in the realm of bioethics and technology from a pers- social conservative perspective? Well, you know, I, I think that there's a tendency in these areas to get really worked up about some issue and then the sky doesn't fall. And so then we forget about the issue and don't realize that actually we were kind of mostly right. It just is taking longer yeah. uh, and it's still there. So, you know, I, I, I do think that um, some of the core bioethics issues that did get a lot of attention at the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, um, have quietly become very important in the meantime, but we sort of got tired of them or we thought they were they, 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 that we were wrong to make them so prominent. And I think that some of what's going on around genetic engineering in China, for example, uh, deserves a lot more attention than it's getting and raises very fundamental questions. Now, I think in some ways we're victims of our own success here because we did actually, uh, I mean, the Bush administration and Republicans in the early 2000s did get the NIH to stop doing a lot of this crazy stuff that it was mm-hmm. doing. And so we felt like, well, that we did it. Um, of course, the NIH is just one agency in one country, mm-hmm. and China never stopped doing any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think there are ways that core questions about the significance of uh, germline genetic engineering for the future of humanity have not been thought through, and we are putting power in our hands without thinking about how to use it. Um, I would say I'm a little more skeptical about concerns that have to do with artificial intelligence, which are a little bit more um, uh, a little bit more contemporary and current. Um, I think I think AI. It, I think it's still the case that artificial intelligence is largely just the next phase of technological development that we haven't given a name to, um, and so it's an always moving target, and it, it always seems like the next big thing is AI, and that's going to get out of control. People have been saying that for 20 years. Uh, yeah, more than that, right? People well, have been saying that. Is for... that just the frog getting boiled alive, like you said? Well, right. So the worry I have is maybe I'm making the same mistake <laughs> that people made about bioethics, and actually this ultimately will be a huge problem. Yeah. I have to say, I've not found reason to be persuaded of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think so far, the arguments that artificial intelligence is going to swallow the world don't strike me as plausible. But that's not a reason to drop the ball and stop thinking about it. Where I think the right has to take technology very seriously is in the ways in which technology interacts with more traditional forms of of power, um, economic power, political power. And there, we're not talking about science fiction. We're just talking about um, we're just talking about control of the flow of information. Uh, we're talking about access to uh, just vast power in our society. Our system of government has always been very sophisticated about the dangers of power, of political power. I think it needs to get sophisticated about the dangers of information power. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're, if anything, at the very, very beginning of that process. But I do think that the growing interest on the right in that question is appropriate and uh, will will prove very valuable. And it's 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 almost a meta political question, right? Because if, if information is the means by which, say, you would hold institutions right. and elites responsible, or vice versa, in some cases, the people responsible for, for their errors as well, and yeah. particular forces with particular interests. It's infrastructural, yeah. right? It, so it's not about the substance of political questions. It's about how do we even get to the place mm-hmm. where we know what's going on in the world mm-hmm. and what people are doing and how they think and where we can be heard ourselves. And the control of that infrastructure has got to be open. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we can't have a free society. Mm-hmm. Do you think 
um, that technology is, do you think it is in evidence that human beings, especially um, in the way that we, we govern ourselves and society in the modern era, are capable of actually directing and putting limits on technological advance? Or are we always just playing catch up? Well, I think we can find ways to use technological power more and less responsibly. Um, and so the, you know, capable of channeling, of directing, probably not. Um, that's true just of power in general. Capable of constraining, of limiting in ways that allow us to use some of the benefits but avoid the worst risks. I do think we can do that. I think we have to think about how. Um, I'm not a fatalist about public policy and government power. I, I and I'm not a, an absolutist libertarian, but I'm very far from it. Um, you know, I'm first and foremost a social conservative, and I think there is a role for the community and for the state to play in thinking about the the atmosphere in which our lives are lived, and therefore the kinds of people we're going to be. So these questions of what public policy should have to say about technology are absolutely crucial. If there's one thing that you think is is heavily under-indexed in this field um, that, that, that everyone's going to care about in 10 years, say, what would you say it is? That, that's a hard question. I mean, I, I guess that I would say that um, it's th the issues that have to do with how young people are formed by their exposure to social media and other technologies are much more important than the issues that have to do with how our politics channel through social media and other technologies. So what adults are allowed to say matters a lot less mm -hmm. than what children are exposed to. And I think we haven't got that balance quite right yet. Yeah. And it it's basically one giant social experiment that's it been is. engaged in with no control group across Absolutely. civilization. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know, 50% of children under eight use social media. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> we have no idea what that means and what that looks like. They're, and, and their parents are not using the same social media. Mm -hmm. And certainly we're not formed by those. A and so, look, I, 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 I don't think that means we're doomed, but I do think it means we're being yeah. very, very irresponsible with our children's future. Yeah. T TikTok is the most traffic website in the world. And I'm fairly certain no one at this table spends any time on it. Yeah. Yeah, we're all too old. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are too old. You are, you are very correct. <laughs> Dr. Levin, how can people keep up with uh, what you're writing and thinking about? You are um, blissfully off of social media, as That's far true. as I can tell, unless there's some lurker Twitter no, account. No. Maybe you're a pseudonymous poster. I don't know. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> but uh, how can people keep up with it, what So you're doing? I'm at the American Enterprise Institute. You can find me at AEI.org. You can look for me there. You can also find a lot of great work by a lot of my colleagues there, and I encourage you to do it. Well, thank you for spending some time with us today. We we really appreciate the, the wisdom that you bring, and uh, you've been a huge influence on us, and uh, thank you for coming by. Thank you very much. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I feel like I could have gone for three more hours with him, and the time would have gone by like that. Uh, he's, he's a delight to talk to, uh, and we hope to have him back on at some point as well. Uh, rate and review this podcast to help make that possible. If this episode gets a ton of great feedback, uh, then, then potentially we'll be able to have him back and have more guests. And uh, please, for God's sake, just review this. I think we're at 130... <laughs> Three reviews. Uh, I think that's the it. most desperate petition I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, let's let's get to 150 and then 200. If we can hit 200 reviews uh, by the end of this year, Nick gets to eat dinner. Um, <laughs> he otherwise, you know, this this ginger boy will not be fed. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something like, "I'll eat my own hat" or like <laughs> no, whatever. But I'm no, not committing to anything. Okay. You will be systematically right. oppressed yeah. if you do not okay. get me 200 reviews. All right. uh, go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything else that we have cooking look through the backlog of this podcast if you're doing some driving or uh, right around this time of year i don't know why you would um this is releasing in i guess uh late september maybe you are maybe you're taking vacation i don't know uh but uh this this podcast is designed to be evergreen the contours of this conversation uh i think will be just as relevant a year from now as they are today and podcasts from a year ago are just as relevant today um check it all out check out americanmoment.org uh follow us on social media at ammoment.org, uh, Nick at Nick S. Solheim, and me at S. Sharma US. And we will see you guys next week. Thank you as always for listening. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. 
Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.